Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us as you're signing on. We're going to give it about two minutes to give everybody a chance to get logged in, and then we'll get started. Thanks to everyone who's joining us. Um, we're gonna give it about one more minute. We'll get started at about two minutes past to give everybody a chance to get on and get settled. So we will start in about one minute. All right, it is two minutes past. Um, I think we probably still have some people joining us, but we'll go ahead and get started so we can take full advantage of our hour. Uh, welcome everyone to our current iteration of our Governing Principles webinar series. My name is Lucy Barrier. I'm a policy analyst here at the Hunt Institute. Uh, we are really looking forward to today's conversation around assessment and accountability policy, um, particularly the shifts that we have seen as a result of the pandemic and the subsequent shift to virtual learning. Um, I would particularly like to thank our panelists, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Kraut, Secretary Ryan Stewart, and Dr. Monique Chisholm, um, as well as our moderator, Laura Jimenez. Thank you so much, all four of you, for being with us today. We're really looking forward to it. Um, for those of you in the audience, we would love to have you tweet along with us during our discussion today. Um, our hashtag is hashtag GovPrinciples, and that is P-A-L-S. Um, and our Twitter handle is at Hunt underscore Institute. Um, if you want to tweet directly at us, um, we will be tweeting from our account as well. Um, and additionally, um, these are largely based on your questions and the conversation is driven by what you want to hear. Um, while we will have too many people to unmute and have you ask your questions individually, we are taking your questions at the Q&A feature at the bottom of your webinar window. Um, so if you submit your question there, we will get it and we will try to ask it um, during this conversation today. And you can start submitting those questions at any time during the webinar and we will just get to those when we start that portion. Um, now I would like to introduce our Director of Higher Education, James Mikulowski, um, who is here to provide some opening remarks on behalf of the Institute. James, over to you. Thanks very much, Lucy, and thanks so much to all of you for joining us for this conversation today. I want to echo Lucy's thanks to our panelists and give some special recognition to Governor Crouch, who is a part of our current cohort of Hunt K Leadership Fellows. Uh, we so appreciate you all being with us. You know, here at the Hunt Institute, across all of our work in education policy, we've seen the importance of bipartisan discussions around some of the critical issues uh, in education policy today, which is why we're so looking forward to hearing the perspectives of the resource experts that are joining us. With the granting of federal testing waivers by the Department of Education last spring, states universally canceled summative assessments for the 2019-2020 school year. Now, as we are entering year two of the COVID-19 pandemic, policymakers, educators, students, and families are asking what role assessments are going to play for this school year, one that has seen tremendous courage and innovation, but also a lot of variance in the instructional opportunities that are afforded to students. Just last week, a number of prominent education policy organizations, including our friends at EdTrust and the Data Quality Campaign, signed a joint letter urging Dr. Miguel Cardona to reject waivers to annual statewide assessments for this upcoming school year on the grounds that we need accurate, objective, and comparable data to speak about the quality of education in this moment. And as always, equity is a really vital lens when it comes to this discussion. In October, Bellwether Education Partners estimated that approximately 3 million of the most educationally marginalized students in the US have not experienced any formal education in person or remotely since March. 
to understand the challenges and opportunities that lay before us, we need to know where students stand and what interventions are available to us to ensure that students can continue to make progress uh, on their educational journeys. Once again, we're so fortunate to have this exceptional panel. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Laura, who is moderating our discussion today. And I'd also like to plug Laura's article from September 2020, discussing student assessment during COVID, which is a wonderful companion to today's discussion. Um, so Laura, thanks so much for joining us. And I will now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you for, for having me. Um, there is almost daily change in terms of the policy and the policy discussion surrounding uh, state's yearly summative tests for the, the current school year. Um, so I will very quickly go over kind of the state of the states and where we are. Um, so as previously mentioned, uh, there were large scale waivers issued for testing and, and accountability for the 1920 school year. In September, the Department of Education said that testing would not be waived for the 2020-21 school year, but that the department would be flexible on accountability, acknowledging that states would be missing significant portions of the data that they use to uh, inform those systems. Um, in October, the department followed up with some guidance, um, again, restating that a waiver of testing would not be granted um, and that uh, the states could push back their timelines to identify uh, those schools that need additional support um, as required by the law. Uh, then in January, there was some further guidance um, issued by the department again, reaffirming that there were not large scale waivers of testing and accountability for the year, um, but there could be um, some additional flexibilities granted and the department kind of laid out what some of those options would be. In between all of this happening, a handful of states uh, since last summer have asked for waivers from the department. All of those requests from the summer uh, were denied um, and there are currently some states who have recently submitted waivers or who are publicly talking about requesting waivers. Um, and there hasn't been a determination yet on those most recent uh, requests or potential requests. Um, but in the midst of all this, there is a potential new secretary to be confirmed as early as next week. And uh, it could be that the department is waiting for that secretary to be confirmed in order to affirm their, their policy. Also in the midst of all this, there was a budget reconciliation that happened this week and there was a potential for um, some uh, introduction of amendments to that to uh, actually waive testing for the year. That didn't materialize. There was one amendment uh, to prevent or that was um, introduced to prevent any future relief funding uh, to not be used for testing, but that was stricken down along party lines. Um, what we're seeing from states currently in terms of what they're saying about testing, I think it's kind of all over the map. Some states are saying, yes, we are going to test. And that would be, uh, for example, Florida and Tennessee. Some states are saying no, that would uh, include Georgia and Washington. Some saying uh, it's optional. Um, and New Mexico is one of those states in that camp. We are privately hearing that about half of the states are planning um, to issue their test. Um, but of course, what the department does next will influence all of this. Um, the other thing to think about that's happening in the background of this larger conversation is that ESSA is due to be reauthorized. And there seems to be a, a we're in a period of, of questioning the value and role of uh, yearly state tests, the standardized test in schools. So how this year goes, uh, what the department ultimately says and how states um, move forward with their testing and accountability, I think will play a very big role in that. So that's kind of the, the context of where we find ourselves in this current moment. And I am pleased to introduce Lieutenant Governor Crouch um, to provide her opening remarks discussing Indiana's approach to assessments and accountability last year and um, how it will inform the state's approach for this year. So let me kick it over to the Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thank you to the Hunt Institute for uh, putting on this discussion. Now, in full disclosure, uh, as Lieutenant Governor, I oversee four agencies, and I also chair a number of initiatives in Indiana, in addition to being President of the Senate. But 
the Department of Education is actually for the first time an appointed position uh, that superintendent in charge of public instruction is an appointed position for the first time starting this year. Uh, so uh, I am not at the expert in education, but I have certainly learned a lot, not just by participating in the Institute, but by learning about the, this, this, this particular subject. I've talked to legislative leaders in Department of Ed, and so my comments come from what I have learned from them. But Indiana has undertaken a series of changes since 2015, including the adoption of new standards and assessments that actually led to a temporary pause in school accountability. So prior to the pandemic, our legislature had already enacted a two-year hold harmless for school year 1819 and 1920. And like so many other states, because our exam is administered in the spring when the country was shut down, we had to cancel the school year 1920 assessment. So currently school accountability is paused. In ordinary times, school accountability is tied to an A through F letter grade system. And we have many passionate advocates who have come forward over the years to express their support or their opposition for Indiana's accountability system. Over the last couple of years, there have been several committees and panels that have closely examined the difficult questions surrounding accountability and assessment. And there is growing consensus among our education leaders that our accountability system should be less punitive and instead focus on transparency of school performance. So we have two bills moving through the House and the Senate that would extend the hold harmless that's currently in place, ensuring that schools are not held responsible for the learning loss that occurred during the pandemic. And one of these proposals also includes a permanent deletion of the consequences and takeover provisions that are currently in our accountability system. So Indiana is moving towards a more robust system of transparency that will provide parents, policymakers, and community stakeholders multiple objective measures of performance. So we're moving from a gotcha kind of attitude to a how can we help inform and be more transparent so that parents and policyholders and community stakeholders can make their own best decisions. So thank you, Laura, for that. Thank you so much. I am now going to kick it over to Secretary Stewart uh, to provide his opening remarks discussing New Mexico's approach to assessments and accountability last year and this year. Uh, thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you to the, the Institute and to all, my, all of my fellow panelists. It's just great to be able to be here and talk about uh, what we know is a very important and hot topic right now in education um, with regard to assessment. And, and in New Mexico, um, like, like most states in the union, of course, we were severely impacted, remain severely impacted um, by our ability to um, have access to in-person learning across the state, um, given the, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and our approach to it from a public health perspective. So um, this past year, the, the governor uh, was actually, I should say, uh, when she took office, one of the, one of the governor's first actions was to uh, remove New Mexico from the park system and to direct the public education department to begin the process of revamping our assessment system. And so we, uh, we were in that process and had made some exciting changes to that. Um, one of which was at the, at the high school level, switching to a college entrance exam in partnership with the SAT um, to, to utilize that as our, as our census test for our 11th graders. And then we also worked with Cognia to revamp our three through eight assessment system, uh, which was going to allow us to um, not only leverage their, their existing platforms and, and data bank, but also build in more um, opportunities for uh, culturally and linguistically relevant uh, assessment items and approaches um, through that system. So, um, so we were and remain excited about those changes that we had uh, in store for last year when COVID hit. And so when COVID hit, 
we, we uh, were one of the early states to, to fully um, shut down our school buildings and move completely remote and remained that way uh, for, for all of the spring as, as many other states did. So we, we did not administer the, uh, the new assessments in the way that, that we had hoped in this past year. Now, moving forward, um, we still have the majority of the state that has been remote for most of this year. We haven't opened up, uh, we hadn't opened up our secondary schools until just this week. Um, so our, our secondary students with, with few exceptions have been remote for the entire time. And then we've had some elementary schools which have been opened in a, in a hybrid model. Um, but even then it's been a, a relatively limited number through this, throughout the state and that's expanding now. So, so we're, in a, we're in a position where uh, we, have, we are one of the states who has put forward a request for a waiver. And the approach that we're taking is, uh, so first of all, we feel that data is important. We need to know what's been happening with our students and, and be able to use that information to target resources and make instructional um, decisions for, for all of our students and to have a pulse on where we are as a state and what the impact of the pandemic has been as a state. Um, but, but we do have a, a waiver out there to rather than uh, test everyone using the, the tools that we, that we have and are excited about, that we would have more flexibility, more options for our schools and districts um, to choose exactly uh, what assessment would look like for them. So in some cases, we would have uh, those schools and districts opting into a, uh, a system where they could still utilize our, our statewide program. But in that instance, we'd be trying to create a sample something that gives us an indication across the state as to where we are with a, with that representative sample population and we would make this available to every school and every individual every individual family that wanted to opt into that as well uh, if families really wanted to see where their students are and, and use those those systems that we have in place the other options we would provide for our schools and districts would be utilizing some of the common assessments that we that we have either in statewide use or in uh, large scale, if not statewide use, that they could also submit as data points. So um, those are some of the, the formative assessments that we give uh, periodically throughout the year, which are not necessarily uh, a part of our summative assessment system. So in this sense, we. We're working to make sure that we can get data, that we can have um, some uh, uh, largest scale to the, to the extent possible um, information that, that we can get that gives us a, a statewide sample. And we really want schools and districts to also focus their work on which assessments can your educators use to understand where your students are right now and be able to make some instructional decisions off of that. So, so that's our approach going forward. There's a, still a lot of unknowns as we make this administrative transition at the federal level. So we are um, anxiously, of course, awaiting uh, how this will all play out and that will, that will ultimately affect our approach. Um, but, um, but we are certainly trying to navigate these, these complexities as a state. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'd like to um, next introduce Dr. Monique Chisholm, who was at the American Institutes for Research to talk about um, her role and AIR's role in working with states last year and this year, particularly around um, the issue of um, equity and assessments and, and making sure that students, especially those that are most vulnerable, um, their learning is understood and uh, being acted upon. Uh, Dr. Chisholm. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the Hunt Institute and um, fellow panelists. This is such an important conversation, um, and it's good to be back in company with Laura. We work together at the Department of Education, so it's it's good to be back in in the same conversation again. Um, I wanted to first just start out by um, talking a little bit about AIR. Um, some of you may know AIR as an assessment uh, organization, and I just wanted to to share that we actually sold our assessment division. About two years ago, um, we wanted to focus on work that was more in alignment with our mission. And so we no longer have the assessment division. Um, and the work that I do at AIR really focuses on bringing evidence and research into practice. And so last, I would say uh, March, when we started to see school closures happen across the nation, um, we really wanted to figure out how we could be of support and a value add to educators who are facing 
unprecedented um, challenges. And so we wanted to create a space um, for people to come together, share, debate, um, really think about innovative strategies um, in a safe space. And so we created um, a state level, state education agency level community of practice. And we actually had um, 35 states join and we um, had 10 learning sessions. And the focus of the community of practice was on equity, access, and opportunity. And really at that time from um, April through July, um, the states were thinking about reopening plans and guidance that they would provide to schools and districts around reopening. So some of our topics focused on social emotional learning, um, accountability considerations and grading, mitigating the COVID learning loss, and also um, learning centered instructional approaches. And I'll share a link um, because the materials from each one of those communities of practice are available uh, for the public. Um, and there might be something valuable there for people. But one of the things that I want to note is that at, um, the a at AIR, we have really focused on the social emotional aspect of what's been occurring through the um, pandemic. And our, our guidance and our support and our technical assistance has really focused on first putting students and families first. And so um, in thinking about collecting data information and um, using assessments, we actually recommend that the first assessment, if it hasn't already occurred, is a, a student and family um, survey to see what the needs are of families and students. Because we know that we can't have instructional environments that meet students' needs unless we've met those primary um, nutrition, safety, security um, responsibilities. So happy to talk more about the equity aspects as we go along, but um, our approach at AIR has been one of support in creating safe spaces for educators to come together to do innovative thinking and planning rather than returning to some normal practices that might not have been supporting best practice. Thank you, Dr. Chisholm, or Monique, as I know you prefer to be called. Um, I I'm, want to say quickly, um, Secretary Stewart, let's put a pin in, in what you mentioned in your opening remarks, which I, I'm understanding to be, we've got to have much better shorter term assessments that are impacting what uh, teachers can do in the classroom, um, because I think that's a really important part of the conversation that I think tends to be missed when we talk about testing in schools because uh, schools really need comprehensive assessment systems. It's not just this yearly summative assessment that matters, but there are a whole series of assessments that teachers give throughout the year that inform what they're doing day to day. And I don't think that we've talked enough about the importance of, of those and investing in those and making sure that not only are they high quality, but that teachers um, are effective at using them and understanding the data they provide. So I just kind of want to put a pin in that because that was kind of what I was hearing was, was going on in the background of your remarks. Um, but let me start with Lieutenant Governor Crouch. I'd, I'd love to um, hear more about the discussion that's been going on in Indiana um, regarding the state's iLearn assessments. Um, and even if the department waives um, the testing and accountability requirements for 2021, like what are you um, talking about regarding iLearn and, and how have issues regarding equity been coming into play in your discussions? Sure, well, we do here in Indiana plan to move forward with testing in 2021. Uh, we recognize the complexities and concerns with on-site testing during COVID-19 and so our Department of Education has prepared guidance to help our schools navigate this challenge. So while we don't wish any additional hardship on our schools or students, we believe it is important to move forward with our iLearn assessment so that we have the information we need in order to know the extent of student learning loss and also how best to allocate resources to assist with learning recovery. And as I mentioned previously, we will ensure that the results of this assessment are not used for accountability purposes and will therefore be used to inform how best to address the recovery ahead. While I am certain that the hold harmless uh, will become law, there's also a chance that statutory consequences 
we have that are tied to accountability might also be removed permanently by legislation that is advancing through the Indiana House. Now, student equity is at the heart of why we need to conduct the assessment. And as of now, before administering the 2021 iLEARN and receiving those results, we only have projections and samples regarding Indiana specific learning loss. So we need better data about what our students' needs are. Indeed, some would like to adjust student expectations for the foreseeable future because of learning loss. That may be prudent, but the irony is we won't know if that's the right policy until we first measure where we are. So equity can't simply be a sentiment that leads to policy changes. To achieve equity, you have to know where you stand and therefore you have to measure. Logistics notwithstanding, hopefully by temporarily maintaining the pause and accountability, we will have achieved the buy-in necessary to encourage participation in iLEARN, leading to the data-driven policies and resources to address inequity or address equity. Our K through 12 schools are receiving federal CARES dollars and Indiana is also creating an additional $150 million grant program to address learning loss over the next two years. So using iLEARN data, we will be able to identify learning disparities that will help to inform how best to allocate those resources. So even if the federal government waives the requirement for assessment during the school year, measuring student learning and progress is fundamental to ensuring student success, especially during the pandemic. Our assessments are one important component of our overall strategy for ensuring success. We know that Indiana's low income students, as well as our students of color and many of our rural students have been disproportionately impacted on, in multiple ways by the pandemic. There are a variety of different disadvantages that a student may face, including single parent families, difficult home lives, drug addiction, and quite honestly, a lack of quality internet connectivity or broadband. Therefore, getting a snapshot of their progress will help us better identify supports for those students. In light of COVID-19, Indiana is developing a study to consider the following research questions following the receipt of our spring 2021 data from assessment. I apologize. I'm president of the Senate, so they're getting ready to go into session. Unfortunately, we heard that over the microphone. Uh, but here are the questions that we are going to be answering in this study that we're doing. Which specific domains in state standards show significant learning loss for students in kindergarten through grade 10? What differences exist in performance, growth, or both performance and growth for specific student groups? What learning gaps are present in foundational skills, specifically literacy and numeracy for early grade levels? What are the overall student learning loss and gaps in education due to the disruption in student education caused by COVID-19? And then what conclusions or recommendations can be made to address student learning loss or gaps in education? But in the meantime, we must also acknowledge that these annual assessments only offer a snapshot of student knowledge and progress, and it's time that we envision how we effectively measure and capture the broader view of student learning loss. High quality K through 12 education is essential to Indiana and our future. And in order to continue improving, we must have a transparent, easy to understand, respected accountability and assessment system. And we must have something that is usable for years and does not keep changing year after year, which makes it impossible for our Hoosier educators and families to follow and understand. 
Yes, I think you make a very great point there about needing consistency. I mean, if, if there's anything that's true in education, it's it's the constant change. Um, yes. and, and I think we've got to really take a hard look about whether that serves our students. Um, Secretary Stewart, you in your opening remarks, you mentioned uh, the changes that you're contemplating for your uh, broader system of, of assessments. Can you talk to us about um, you know, what your thinking is behind that and, and how those conversations are unfolding and, and where you are in that decision making and, and when you think all of uh, those decisions are going to be finalized and how you're going to roll that out. So like, what does this look like is, is really my question. Yeah, great, great question, Laura. And, and a lot depends really on what happens here in the, in the upcoming weeks as we have a, uh, hopefully our new secretary get confirmed and we get some more uh, direction at the federal level about uh, what that approach will be. I think um, we've, we've done a lot of surveying of various stakeholders throughout the state about um, this, this, the, the approach that I mentioned before that we're, that we're looking to take for assessment and um, about 92 to 93% of the, the comments that we've gotten back and feedback has, has really been highly in support of taking this approach. So we think that there's a, a large scale um, uh, groundswell of support for it among our educators, among our school and district leaders, among our families. Um, and and so, so, so we think that there, there is that sentiment. Um, the, a lot of the work that we've done right now is engaging our, our district and our school leaders and also our testing coordinators throughout the state to really talk through the mechanics of it, what it might look like and go into um, some of the questions like what happens if you don't actually have students coming in person for in-person learning and, and how will we, how will we um, administer tests in that environment? Um, what happens if as a district, we don't opt in to um, the, the statewide assessment, but we have individual families who do want to opt in, how can we, how can we do that? So, so there's been a lot of um, problem solving with some of the logistics. And then um, there's also been a lot of work that we've been doing with the Center for Assessment, which has been a partner that we've been working with in a variety of contexts around assessment, but including this, to really get some of their um, expert opinions as well as to uh, what some of the issues are, what some of the challenges are, and how we can best try to mitigate, how we can create a sampling program, um, how we can uh, work through some of the, the uh, hurdles and, and thinking about if you're, if you're using different types of assessments and getting in this kind of data, well, then what does your reporting structure need to look like? And um, where where, do, where can you make valid claims that are supported by uh, the evidence and where, where can you not make valid claims that are supported by the evidence? So really trying to understand those limitations. Um, and then I would, I would also say that, uh, uh, and, and you spoke earlier about the need for this robust assessment system uh, we have ongoing work still in, in partnership with the Center for Assessment and others around, um, especially now, where are we going to have additional opportunities to create um, the kinds of assessments that, that are more, again, culturally and linguistically relevant. That's a huge, huge issue for us here in New Mexico. Um, and that, that really help our students and our families own the results of that assessment, uh, not see it as, you know, a, a disconnected report that's off to the side, but really um, a, a true reflection of the hard work that they've done and the, the, the skills and knowledge and domains that they have mastered um, and in a way that allows them to, to demonstrate that in multiple ways. So we're, so we're uh, deep in the work on trying to design that, trying to design that system and design it at statewide scale um, so that we can have both the, 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 the the, the uh, hoped for goals of um, creating highly engaging, highly relevant, very feedback rich assessments that have the administrative capacity and scalability and validity to be able to operate, operate at the statewide level. Yes, I, I would note that um, it, it seems like you, you both, Lieutenant Governor and Secretary Stewart are, are both underlying what, what you just said, we need to understand what questions we want to ask about the data, and then that will lead us to what data is going to answer that question, which I think, um, Monique, you have you have talked about as well. Um, can you share a little bit more about 
um, your remarks around analyzing the right data for the right questions. Like, what are you all thinking about is the right data and, and the right questions? Would love to get your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And just thank you to both uh, Lieutenant Governor and Secretary Ryan Stewart. Um, these decisions are so difficult and it's so interesting to see how each state has approached this policy question. And um, there's no one right answer. But um, what I would say is that what we do have right now are projections about learning loss, right? We, we first understood that from the projections that maybe there was gonna be a seven month learning loss on average. And that for black students, it was probably gonna be 10 months, Hispanic students, nine months. And then for low income students, about a year of loss. And so I think educators across the nation are um, really motivated to figure out how students are doing, um, where they need to focus their instruction on instruction and then how to really help to support students in their learning goals. I think when you think about equity and assessments, there's two perspectives. And I just wanna briefly talk through those really quick because I think it's important for the policy question. So one perspective around using um, state standards as an, a tool for equity is that they require, since, since the standards, um, since the assessments require alignment to rigorous standards, they're um, comparable, that you disaggregate the information so you have information about um, student achievement gaps and perhaps student growth and proficiency. You can um, then use this information publicly on report cards to help share information. And then they also become a lever by which, um, and I think this is where both states have articulated um, the sensitivity of what we're going through right now, become a lever um, to hold schools and districts accountable. So when you think about equity and access, especially for racial ethnic minority students, English learners, students with disabilities, um, those are important key considerations for thinking about using a high stake annual assessment at this time. The other side of the argument or the other position um, really offers that we don't have any evidence to demonstrate that high stakes assessments actually contribute to um, addressing equity gaps. And that in fact, it might have a counter effect that um, the focus on the outcome, the achievement of students really shifts the conversation away from the inputs, funding for schools, effective teachers, supports and resources, all of the things that go into a high quality education system um, become muted as you focus on the outcome of the assessment. Um, also that in prepping and planning for the assessments in math and, and reading, that you can lose focus on other important content areas that often are the spaces by which students are most creative that help to engage rigorous thinking um, and the transfer of knowledge and information. And so I'm not gonna take a position here because I know that these policy decisions are, are very complex and um, nuanced in the um, environment and the communities that you're in. But what I will say is that the right question should be what's right for students. Um, if, if the state or the district has not had an opportunity to bring students back into the school building, then bringing them back for an annual assessment is, is probably not the right decision. Um, if it's not safe to go back for learning, then it's not safe to go back for an annual assessment. I think the other question to ask is, um, what information do we need to have to help teachers improve their practice? And I, I think that's where Secretary Stewart was kind of um, going towards in his conversation, um, because there are many ways that teachers every day um, measure assessment through informal assessments, through formal assessments, um, end of unit um, exams, um, there are many ways in which teachers are collecting data and information to assess where student learning currently is. And I would, I would argue that we have really good teachers and we should empower them and support them in doing the work that they're good at. Um, so I think the right question, the right data, Laura comes back to me is what's right for the students. I fully 100% agree with Lieutenant Governor Crouch that Standardized assessments are a tool that we have in our toolbox to um, focus on equity and access, but it's just one tool. And I think right now there are really important questions that are going on related to the health safety um, concerns of students, um, social emotional needs 
that might take precedent over an annual assessment. Thank you, Monique. And actually, that was a perfect segue. I'd like to ask um, one follow up uh, for Secretary Stewart and then open it up to the audience Q&A. Um, so sticking with the, the, the topic of teachers. So as, as states are re-examining their assessment and accountability policies and practice in the interest of equity, right? I think that has been woven throughout this conversation. Um, what conversations are being had around equity for teachers? Um, so how do we use assessments to support um, teachers, you know, as opposed to um, what could be perceived as um, punishing them, um, you know, particularly as we work to diversify the teaching profession. And we know that there is very compelling data, you know, that, that the diversity of the teaching workforce actually matters to students. Um, and at the same time, you know, what methods um, can we use to ensure that every child has access to a high quality, well, not high quality, a highly effective teacher um, in their classroom? Well, I guess uh, I ask a question in response, Laura, which is how much time do we have uh, to answer that? Those are a lot of really um, big, um, important questions. So, so I'll do my best to, um, to, to dive into them, but I think you're really hitting on some just some really key parts of the educator ecosystem um, that we that we I think probably all are struggling with the states about how we how we address some of these. So, with regard to the makeup and diversity of the teaching force, which I, I heard is one of your questions. Um, so we're in the middle of our revamp of our strategic planning process and very explicitly putting in action items specific to the specific to this and, and goals around it and are are beginning the work with our colleges of education and with our legislature around what are the incentive programs what are the the higher ed strategies what are the um, new legislation that we can put in place to to build this pipeline of a of a more diverse teacher workforce that better represents all of our communities across the state and that's going to take everything from um, uh, incentive programs and loan forgiveness programs and tuition assistance programs to help um, help um, candidates who want to enter the profession to eliminate those restrictions and barriers, which more often than not um, uh, 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 keep our, our um, potential um, Native American teachers and Hispanic teachers and African American teachers and teachers who come from um, circum who grew up in circumstances of poverty and, and so on from being able to enter into the profession. Um, and then it also takes um, investing in those who are already school staff, either as instructional aides or, or um, who, are, who are working in other support programs who uh, are studying to be teachers, providing supports for them to, to enter into the profession as well and working with our higher ed programs to really help recruit and diversify their um, their um, uh, candidates for, for their programs. So, so it really will take, I think, a lot of efforts on, on each of those levels to help diversify in, in that sense of the equity question that I heard from you. Um, the, the, other, the first part of the question that I heard from you was around what's the role of assessment and the state and how we look at assessment and then uh, respond um, with, with a teacher based on their, based on their results. And as a former teacher and someone who spent a lot of time coaching new teachers, I think there's a fundamental question in there about uh, what's the reason why uh, we're seeing those struggles that are there and what do we think the root cause is and what, what is the right kind of solution if we truly are about helping that educator to grow and be more effective in their job and stay in the profession longer. And I think um, there can be an assumed root cause of uh, they just don't feel enough pressure if, um, if our response is we're going to use our assessments as a hammer and come down really hard on you and label you and, and, and um, uh, subject you to a, a disciplinary system, if that's, if that's the only approach that we take. And instead, what, what we have to do and what I think is really hard to do, because I don't think states are traditionally good at this, is look at it and say, we have some real opportunities here to grow this educator in their practice. What resources are we bringing to bear at the state level strategically based on the information that we have that can really help 
that particular individual serve their students more effectively. And, and I think that um, it's hard because at, at the state level, you're, you're, you're way up here and kind of, kind of looking down and, and when, when you're at the, on the ground with a teacher, so much of that can be done in the conversations that you have and in the observations that you've made and say, hey, I've got this great resource. We can really make this unit or this lesson or this pedagogical strategy come alive for you. Whereas at the state, you, you tend to just kind of live more in the spreadsheet world and live more in, in that data world. So we have to really push ourselves to, to, to get down to that level. Um, the bigger the state you are, the harder it gets. So, so for us, that's one of the things that we're trying to do, work much more closely, both with our, our districts, our schools, and our regional centers to, to try to bridge that gap and bring in more partners who can really work on the ground to um, help translate that. Here's the results, here's the needs, and then here's the, um, here's the support that we're going to provide gap that we have in many places. But, but it's a it is a it's a tough road and it takes a lot of new systems being built at the state level to even know how to use the data to identify where those gaps are. And we're not all the way where we need to be. We have a long way to go, but, but that's our ultimate goal. So now I'm gonna transition over to some uh, other questions from the audience. One big part of the discussion, I'm sure that you all have been involved and I know that I'm hearing as well is how valid and reliable do we think the test results might be? Um, so let me just give a little background, how valid a measure, right? Are, are we measuring what we think we are measuring um, and reliable? Are the scores going to be equatable across different administrations of the test? Um, and those are two technical qualities that we look for state tests to have to be very valid and very reliable given the uses in them in um, state accountability systems. So um, what discussions have you been part of and what concerns do you have about um, the validity and reliability of the test this year, especially if they're given remotely, which is you know maybe not how they were originally designed um, and because they are designed assuming that students are um, receiving a certain amount of instruction. Um, so we'd love for any one of you to, to respond to that. All right, I can, I can jump in really quickly. Um, I think that's the key question for the remote administration. There's a number of, of um, considerations that I think are important considerations. The first one is, you know, one of the components of the law is the requirement of 95% participation. And um, that's done so that we can ensure that um, racial ethnic minority students, English learners, students with disabilities, students who are often falling through the cracks are included in the assessment so that we have um, a true picture of um, performance. So part of the first question becomes, you know, reaching students. We know that our low-income students and racial ethnic minority students are disproportionately have not received um, instruction during this, this pandemic. So the first question for me becomes reaching students. The, the second one is also related to um, there might be some help and influence that students are getting from parents. So, you know, not in a bad way to harm the student, but as the student is taking the test, the parent actually might help and support, maybe answer some questions. So I think what we've been hearing is the question is, is it, is it really measuring what the student knows and understands? Or are there other help aids that are, are helping um, the student? And there's really no way to know that unless you're doing kind of a virtual monitoring, which for many reasons in the K-12 space is not ideal or optimal. So I think there's just a number of administration concerns with remote testing that have been raised. Great, thank you so much. Um, so the next uh, question from the audience goes to uh, Lieutenant Governor Crouch. Um, many school districts in areas of the country are still either fully remote or in some form of, of hybrid format. We know that internet access is currently an equity issue that would hinder getting an accurate picture of learning loss if we're testing remotely. Can you share more about how remote and in-person assessments are being discussed? You're muted. I 
we are planning on doing our testing in person. Um, and so the Department of Education has provided guidance to school districts on how we may allow that and have that to happen. And it's so interesting that you mention um, broadband and connectivity because what we learned as a state, as I'm sure all states learn, is that never has being connected been so important as right now with COVID because we have workers that are teleworking, we have health care being delivered telehealth, and of course, many of our students have been doing e-learning. Uh, and so that ability to be able to be connected is absolutely critical moving forward. Uh, and so we have invested a hundred million dollars from the state. We have another, I believe it's a hundred or 250 million that is in this upcoming budget to continue to be sure that our Hoosiers in our unserved areas are connected. So that being connected, that broadband is such an important part of students being able to minimize their learning loss. Um, but for many students that, particularly in our rural areas, that is just taking place. As we mentioned earlier, um, the reason to do testing, at least from you know, our perspective, is to just get some measure of where, where we are right now and not to make it punitive not to attach any accountability to it, but to get a measure of where we are right now so that we can determine where that learning loss is occurring, what groups it's occurring in, and then we can focus our resources. And as I mentioned, we have 150 million currently being proposed to address that learning recovery efforts uh, moving forward in the summer and beyond. So it's absolutely, uh, in, our, in our eyes, it's absolutely critical to do testing and to get that measurement, understanding that it's not used for anything other than where are we right now and how can that inform our policy decisions moving forward in terms of learning loss recovery in those groups that are adversely affected. Um, because there is no way that we can develop the right policy and direct resources appropriately if we don't have that data. Yes, got it. Thank you so much. So I think we've got time for about one more uh, question and I would love for um, as many of you to, to respond um, as we can. Um, we focused a lot about the role of assessments that they play in accountability um, be, because um, many believe that this is one important measure of equity of opportunity and equity of, of, of outcomes. Um, but what about other measures that um, could be used to ensure that students are receiving an equitable opportunity to learn? Are there some non-test based measures that um, any of you have discussed that could be important to uh, be tracked now and moving forward? Well, as I had, I had mentioned, you know, the study that the Department of Education is doing to kind of determine uh, and make decisions regarding all that. And, and I, I mentioned those earlier, so I don't know that I need to go through them, but we're kind of in the process of kind of figuring that all out right now. Um, and so the study that we will do will actually allow us to come to conclusions and make recommendations that we can use to help address that student loss uh, and those gaps in education. So that is something that is in the Indiana is ongoing right now to help us determine how to do that. I think for New Mexico, one of the one of, one of the things I'm excited about with the work that we're doing in assessment is we're, we we really want to get to that point where tests aren't just seen as a a thing that the you know students take once in a while to you know get a score, but really that that families are invested in it, communities are invested in it, students are invested in it, along with their their educators. And so uh, some of the work that we're they were doing is how do you scale that? And how do you how do you build a system where um, the that demonstration of learning actually starts with a clear um, uh, scope of work with the community to define out 
here's what matters to us and and what we think is uh, what our hopes and dreams and, and needs are for our children and and ways that we can see that that um, encapsulated in the school and then build uh, larger scale um, assessment systems, whether those be pencil and paper, whether they be portfolios or presentations um, or some combination thereof that that really reflects that work that we can roll up at the state level and be able to say, uh, not only do we feel like those, um, you know, the, 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 those basics of, of the standards are met, but communities can really stand up and be very proud of uh, we see the, the what we want from our schools reflected in this assessment and and our and the the way in which our students are demonstrating that competency is built into the to the method of administration and so um yeah i think we're starting the work right now around that first piece of working with community to build out um what are those things and how do we um uh, have a, a kind of reliable way to uh, have that reflected, uh, have students be able to demonstrate that. And then we'll continue to build up into the, all right, so what does this look like across our different communities and what's common, what's distinct, um, and and how can we best operationalize that? And Laura, I would just add just really quickly um, that I think that's exactly right. The formative assessments, the performance-based assessments um, are are all good tools. But I was reminded in the comments of something that's so important. Um, and I, I fell into this um, also during this conversation, but really what we, when we talk about assessments right now, what we're, we're measuring is an opportunity to learn. How have students during this last year had the opportunity to learn and engage? And that's really what we're, we're measuring. And what's important for teachers to have is information on where they need to meet students in their learning. And we need to remember that as, as uh, Secretary Stewart was talking about setting the goals and the vision, we wanna remember not to fall into a deficit mindset. So as we think about where students are in their learning, we're really asking the question of how do we meet them where their needs are? And so just two really important points that I didn't do a good job myself during this conversation, but to focus on what are the key questions that we need to ask about opportunity to learn. And as we set our goals for policy and practice, let's really focus on not having a deficit mindset. I think that is a wonderful point to end on. I will thank you all for your time and I'm going to kick it back over to Lucy who is gonna close us out. Thanks, Laura, I really appreciate it. And want to again, thank all our panelists. Um, this is an amazing conversation. I learned a lot. I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, wanted to go ahead and let everyone know before we leave that we do have some additional upcoming webinars. Um, including on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, um, the next installment of our post-secondary pathways, higher education data and equity. Um, if you are interested in joining us for that one, wanna go ahead and register, then the link is in the chat. You can go ahead and just click on it from there and join us. Um, and once your webinar window closes, you will be taken to a survey. Um, we would love it if you would just take a moment. It's very short, um, but filling that out will help us ensure that we are constantly improving to better serve you and design webinars that are based on what you need to hear. Um, if you have any questions or any comments, feel free to reach out to us here at the Hunt Institute. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it.